This is all going to be a, a presentation about thinking different, going in the opposite direction. You know, this, who remembers this campaign? Who's old enough to remember this campaign? 1997, Steve Jobs, Think Different. That's the year I started optimizing in Alta Vista, started with SEO, before Google appeared in September 98. Think Different. Remember those crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the ones that thought they could change the world, the ones that actually pushed the human society forward. We wrote books about them. We made movies about them. These were the crazy ones. But don't be fooled. These people are all around us. And maybe, just maybe, they're in this room today. Now, as we move from products to services, we'll need you to think different. As we move from ownership to access, we're going to need you to think different. As we move from a world of scarcity into a world of abundance, we're going to need you to think different. Think different. Some people today look at problems and they complain. They complain forever. While other people look at problems and they see opportunity. They see an opportunity to solve. They see an opportunity to build a better world. The question you need to ask yourself is, who are you? What choices are you going to make? So in the next 15 minutes, while everybody's getting into the dirt, digging in, getting their hands dirty, and look at the tactics that are working today, we're going to go in the other direction. We're going to go up into the clouds. and We're going to listen. We're going to listen for tomorrow. Because as David Bowie once said, the future belongs to those who hear it coming. So while Elon Musk is redefining transportation with Tesla, SpaceX, the boring company, Hyperloop, and redefining energy with SolarCity and, and these, these mega factories, the best minds of our generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click more ads. We all know who they are. But in a mobile environment, the only ads people want to see are the ads they would miss if they were not there. Who's watched Mad Men? Yeah, a couple. It's Don Draper, one of the main characters in Mad Men. And this was about the TV industrial complex when it all went from radio to television. One thing you've got to understand is that in the, you know, 50 years ago, when it went from radio to television, these were all mediums, radio, television, outdoor advertising. These were mediums created by advertisers and marketers to focus attention, bring people in for the content, and deliver a message. They had control. And what's happening now is that the internet, the biggest mass communication media we have today, was not created by advertisers and marketers. It was created by a bunch of nerds. And now we're having to market and tell stories through this medium. It's highly fragmented and people are very impatient. Back in the 50s and 60s, it was unheard of that people would block your ads. And now they do it by default. Who here has heard of Seth Godin? Put your hands up. Three people. Keep your hands up. Who's read one of his 19 books out of these three people? Very good. Still one hand. Was it the purple cow? Okay, 19 books. So nobody has read The Purple Cow. Okay, little tip. Go to audible.com. It's a company owned by Amazon. It's free. Download the app. The first book is free. Get The Purple Cow and listen to it. It takes about three to four hours. It's an amazing book. It's about how to market yourself in a noisy world, how to be remarkable, how to stand out from the crowd. And that's more relevant than ever today in this noisy environment. Who's heard of the FM commerce gap? Wow. So you know, this is what we're all fighting for. You realize that. We're all fighting for this. This is the difference between the time spent on mobile and the dollars spent on mobile. We're all fighting now. Everything we're doing in e-commerce, in online marketing, we're all trying to bridge this gap, the M commerce gap. This is a study from Comscore. 
It's called the mobile hierarchy of needs, like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. They did a study and they've pinpointed all of the pain points people have. Why aren't they spending dollars on mobile? You know, from security to can't compare pages to difficult to navigate to too slow to all these things. I advise you, it's free. You can download the report from Comscore. Have a read of it. This is slide 41. Make sure you study this one. I wrote a blog post. It's on my blog. It's the latest blog on this particular topic. And as we just try to take something old and try to put it into the new and figuring out that it doesn't work all that well, what we, what, what's going on is that people are just blocking. This is ad blocking. We just heard of it. 625 million ad blockers. Well, this is this. Look. 400 million on mobile, the green line, and 200 something million on desktop. This, who's heard of Mary Mika and the State of the Internet Report? Who reads that? Too few people, three, four. It's the biggest event of the year when it comes to digital marketing, when it comes to technology. Mary Mika, it's 355 slides, and she publishes it every June. And this is what Silicon Valley, everyone in Silicon Valley waits for. There are amazing slides on the state of advertising and marketing as it is today. And this sentence up the top wraps it up very nicely. Users increasingly opt out of things they don't want because now they're empowered. They can. And we all know that Google's coming out with their own ad blocker that's going to be defaultly built into Chrome and people are just going to, it's probably going to even going to be turned off by default. And this is a slide I use um, when I'm talking to my agency. It's, this is hard. It's hard work to change. Change is hard work. We don't like it. What this is, whether you're in a marketing team trying to influence a board or whether you're an agency worker trying to influence a client to adopt the new, the tractor driver, that's us. These are the agency workers. These are the marketers trying to get things done. The tractor is all the knowledge that we have, the collective knowledge, all the technology. The tree is the client or it's your board. And the soil is the old, dying, infertile soil. You're trying to pull them out of this infertile soil and trying to get them into more fertile soil so they can survive. And of course, this is, um, this is analogous to following the consumer on mobile. And it's about this. It's about going from the old to the new. This is a digital transformation. It's about transforming into a, the information age, into an age where digital is becoming more and more important. But you know what? To adopt the new, you sometimes have to let go of the old. It's the old that's holding you back. And that's what we're all having trouble with, is letting go of the old. And right now, just as an entrepreneur has to transform through the eye of the needle, put himself through the eye of the needle, leave himself behind, leave herself behind in order to build a business, so do organizations now have to transform through these little devices we have in our pockets because that's where the consumer is. And unless you're there, and in time you're going to be made irrelevant if your consumer is consuming on mobile. I've got IA in there. We all know what AI is. Who know what IA stands for? Intelligent assistance. Intelligent <laughs> digital assistance. That's what Karen's going to be talking about after me. It's these assistants, these are our portals to the digital world. These are going to help us to get things done. They're our conduit to data. Data is just bits and bits and bytes. We don't understand much from it. These assistants are going to understand the data and make sense out of it and help us live our lives. So what we're doing now, we're really trying to build relationships through technology. Listen, business has always been about relationships from the very beginning. There's a need and there's someone willing to fulfill that need. A relationship is made, business is done. It's always been about relationships. And now we're trying to do that at scale through the internet, which is disappearing because we're always connected to it, becoming digital now. We're building relationships through technology. And I can see you in the eyes now, right? I can see you, see if you're confused. I can see if you're happy. I can see if you're interested. There's so much input output going on here. And now we're trying to do that through devices. And when you have two people communicating with each other behind mobile phones, it's the data that tells the story about how that relationship is. Is it healthy? Are they sad? Are they annoyed? Is there trust? Is there belonging? All things that are part of a relationship, it's in the data. 
That's why data is becoming the new oil, because it's a conduit to relationships, to understanding how valuable relationships are. So an invisible revolution is coming and it's facilitating the mobility of human experience. You know, it's not our devices moving around. It's us with them. And the mobile phone right now is at the center. And you're going to see that over the next decade, we're seeing it now already, that our environment are going to be peppered with all these digital portals. And these are actually brands already stepping in. We call this the Internet of Things. Brands stepping in and building relationships through technology. They put these devices into your hands to try and help you live your life, to try and empower you, to drive value in your life. The ulterior motive, of course, is that they want, to under, they want to build relationships and they want the data in order to understand the relationship they're in with you. And then through that data, they can serve highly relevant advertising because they understand you, they know what relationship you're in. These devices are about to double. Between now and 2020, it's going to go from 25 billion to 50 billion. It's going to double the amount of devices connected to this thing called the Internet of Things. But so are people. We're going to connect another two and a half billion people in the next three years. India, China, and all of the people that are now not so fortunate as us. There's going to be two and a half billion of them that are going to get the same capabilities that we are, have the luxury to have right now. And probably half a billion of those are going to take on entrepreneurship and try to build their own thing. And we're going to have to compete with that. It's only the beginning. We're in the plumbing phase. We're trying to connect all this stuff up together. It's not working very well. We're showing the capabilities. The mobile phone's at the center, whether it's a wearable or a smart car or a thermostat in your home or a smart TV. We're connecting up slowly and surely, and as it's working, we're adopting it. Conversational commerce, it's coming. We're going back to the way it used to be, a conversation over the counter. When I'm talking about listening about to the future, think about what's really important in our lives, the relationships that we have with each other, how we do business. We're trying to now take technology out or make technology so good that it becomes a conversation. That's why conversational commerce is coming. There's a lot of hurdles, there's a lot of pitfalls, there's a lot of failure, there's a lot of learning along the way, but it's coming. And there have been a lot of bottlenecks over the last decade, but it's coming. And it's going to be powered by virtual assistants, intelligent digital assistants. We've got Siri that we all know. That was one of the first ones that Apple purchased. They purchased Siri. But the very, very first assistant was that annoying little paperclip in Word. You know, that popped up and said, you know, can I help you? And you get out of here. That was the very first one. Siri purchased by Apple. Cortana is from Microsoft. Alexa, uh, Alexa is from Amazon. We've got a lot of Amazon Echoes being installed in the US. We're over 10 million already, and I don't know how many dots, Echo Dots, are being installed. They're in every room. Amazon's really into the business of building relationships through technology. Notice that they all have female names, Siri, Cortana, Alexa. Notice that Google didn't give its own assistant a name. It's the Google Assistant. You know why they did that? This is my guess. It's because we don't need more relationships. From Siri to Cortana to Alexa, who's behind these things? What are these things? Do I have to build a new relationship with them? The Google Assistant, we already have a relationship with Google. The only thing Google has from us is trust and respect. If they lose that trust, it's, it's over for Google. So their assistant, it's all about you. It's all about, it's my assistant. And who am I going to share my data with? It's my own personal assistant that's going to help me in the digital ecosystem. If you haven't watched the Google Assistant, small one and a half video, one and a half minute video on YouTube, go and watch it. Make a note. It actually explains what an assistant does. It connects you to everything. It helps you live your life. And the funny thing is, why are they all female? You know, Jarvis, the, the person from, from, from um, what was it? Uh, um, who can help me out that movie with Tony Stark? Iron Man. You know, Jarvis was a personal assistant from Tony Stark, right? And, and, and Mark Zuckerberg is building at home in his pet project uh, a Jarvis, which is meant to be the digital assistant for Facebook. It's still very early. But what's really important to also realize is that these assistants mean nothing unless there's data behind them. 
And how do you think the Google Assistant is going to help you? It has to have access to data, and that's where Google search engine which is probably a disappearing search engine. We're going to Google less and less, and it's coming to us more and more. That's been a trend over the last two decades. We used to go to the internet and connect to it, and with the arrival of social and mobile, the internet comes to us in our context when we need it. These assistants get their information from somewhere. Who's seen the Burger King ad, where it was a 15 second ad, and the guy said, I haven't got, I've got 15 seconds, I'm not going to tell you what's in this burger, but okay, Google, what is the Whopper burger? And everyone's Google Homes went off and it started talking because they, it, it heard, OK, Google, and what's the Whopper Burger? And of course, that information came from Wikipedia and it became a whole story. But um, go and watch that. It's uh, the Burger King commercial with, with um, Google Home. So bots. Bots are going to become more and more important as we move forward. Bots are simply simple, very narrow AIs, intelligent assistants. They can do one task and they can do really well from transferring money, to ordering pizza, to ordering an Uber, to checking in with KLM, to changing your seats, to calling up the weather, to asking a question. Bots are an incredible opportunity for brands to step in and have a conversation with their customers. Disintermediate everything. Direct communication with the customer at scale. And a lot of these questions that customers are asking, they're all standard questions. These can all be read from a data file. You know, what are your opening times? What's your address? When are you closing? Do you have any specials today? These are things that can be answered by bots. And when it gets too complicated, then the system defaults to human. One thing you've got to be careful of is don't try to pretend that you're human when you're a bot, because that's where the relationship goes sour. That's where you go, I mean, this guy's, we're really good at detecting bullshit. It's true. That's our sixth sense. Detec it's a bullshit filter. So you can experiment with these things already, from the Allo app to the Kick app, you can experiment, you can, there, there are 40,000 bots in Kik, you can chat with them. You can, Allo app is the, the first uh, Google chat with um, the Google Assistant built in. You can ask it questions, ask it to help you. Slack is of course just a bot, and Line and WeChat are huge in Asia. I mean WeChat, if you ask kids, we're talking about WeChat tomorrow, there's a presentation on it. If you ask kids, you know, what's the internet? In, in, in China, they'll tell you it's just WeChat. They do everything in WeChat. They don't leave WeChat. Everything comes to them. That's our future. Now, depending on the country, it comes in at differ, differing paces. You know, we're quite conservative sometimes in how, because with chat, the thing is you have to share everything. You have to share your data. You have to let it connect everything. Otherwise, it's useless. So we have to give into the relationship. So it's all about relationships. It's all about trust. So for this last year, early last year, I developed a model it's called Meaningful Connections. It's, uh, it's nine words, and what it is, is that it's about how we're building relationships meaningful, through meaningful connections online. On the one side, you have the security. This is the platforms. This is where we build things. This is the World Wide Web, a linked devices that generate data. And because there are so many devices, we've given it a name, the Internet of Things, just a lot of things connected to the Internet. And because it's big data, because there's a lot of data, we've called it big data. But where it really took a turn is where Google started to use this data to personalize. So on the other side, it starts with personalization. This is how we build relationships through technology. We use the data to build personal relationships. Relationships are, per definition, very personal. Otherwise, it's not a relationship. You know, whether it's with technology or whether it's with a person, it's still a relationship and it's very personal. You know, my iPhone is very personal. It's all about me, I build it, it's a behavioral space. And that's how Apple does it. But Google does it by understanding you and giving you the right answer when you ask the question. And then it goes to experiences, you know, Google Maps. It's an experience that you share with Google. It's the ultimate of branding. It's Google sharing an experience with you through Google Maps, empowering you to get from A to B as efficiently as possible, and driving great value in your life, whether it be saving time, saving money, Whatever we define as value, everybody defines it differently. And then ultimately, it needs to help us live happier lives because that's, that's what we all have in common. We all seek happiness. And that's the only way this thing's going to be sustainable. But technology disruptors are also using this model to hijack relationships, hijack traditional relationships. Think about retail. Think about the bookstores you used to walk into, buy a book. 
25 bucks, you bought that book, you walked out, you checked it out, you walked out. Now Amazon gives you an app, it's called the Price Checker app. You still walk into your bookstore, you pull out your phone, you scan the barcode, you see that Amazon has it for half the price, you click one button and it's waiting for you when you get home. They've hijacked a relationship and they've done it by understanding what you want. They've done it by putting technology into your hands and empowering you to get things done more efficiently, get greater value, and ultimately help you live happier lives. Airbnb, Uber, these companies just build platforms, highly personalized platforms. They know exactly where I'm going. They know exactly what my intent is. It's an experience, these platforms. I mean, think of an Uber. What is Uber? You click a button, a car pulls up, you step in, you have a pleasant conversation, and you step out. That's it. It's an experience. And what's Amazon building now? Well, have, who's heard of the Amazon Go stores? A few people. So you know what they call these stores? You know what the technology that, that's behind them? It, it, they call it just walk out technology. You walk into the store, you take what you want, and you just walk out. There's no cash registers, there's no paying, it's all charged to your Amazon account. If you've got Amazon Prize, you, Prime, you all get discounts. And why are they doing this? Because they're actually wanting to come into communities and understand how people are consuming. Understand the data. Get them to consume through digital channels so that they can measure the data and they can use that to, to, to improve their recommendation engines. Whether it be on the Amazon platform itself or through digital advertising. One of the big things we're going to come up across, one of the big disruptions that are going to happen in the next few years is that Amazon is probably going to disrupt Google and Facebook. They're launching their own advertising platform and they've got a ton of data. Facebook, <laughs> highly personal. They don't even have a website. It's our own profiles. We build it. It's all our content. We connect with our friends and family. We consume news through it. It's an experience. Whatever you want to call it, it's an experience. Facebook is amazing. Two billion people connected to it. Some people refer to Facebook as the internet. You know, it's highly empowering. You connect with friends and family all over the world. It's so efficient. It drives value in our lives until we consume too much of it, until we become too disconnected. Hyperconnection is often disconnection on the other side. Who's heard of the Dunbar number? 150 meaningful relationships is about as much as we can handle. That's called the Dunbar number. What happens when you have 500 relationships you can maintain just because you can, because Facebook empowers you, or, or, or Instagram, or Snapchat, or whatever, empowers you to have all these hundreds of relationships? Well, your valuable relationships, they fall apart. Because it's all about now quantity over quality. So Facebook needs to do some serious thinking, and I'm sure they'll get through it, because Facebook isn't about Facebook. You know, when things are free, you're the product. That's one rule. It's the data that's valuable. And they, all they want to do is get you to behave. But the Facebook model with investors is, is flawed because it actually it's a pleasure trap to get you in and hold your eyeballs for more time because that's how they can deliver digital advertising. And that's where it breaks down because um, if you spend too much time on Facebook, it's not good for you. Just like our mother said, right? Too much of anything is not good for you. So they need to really think about that. But Facebook will handle it because Facebook, they're all about being super adaptive, super agile. They're able to adapt to whatever, whatever you throw at them. Okay, so pretty well the last slide. So I was thinking, how am I going for time? One minute? I've only got one minute left. One minute, one slide, how can I give you as much information as I can? How can I drive as much value? There's no buzzwords or quotes I can put up on this slide that are gonna do anything with you. I can give you six podcasts the way I consume content. These are amazing. The social media marketing podcast, amazing. All the new stuff on, on, on social media, Facebook, Instagram, bots, it's all there. You just have to go and listen to it. Listen to it while you're in the car. Six Pixels of Separation by Mitch Joel. It's a podcast that everyone here needs to listen to. It's amazing. Gary Vaynerchuk, the man, this guy's pretty hardcore. I can promise you one thing, 70% of you will love him and the other 30% will hate the, his guts. But he's about to become extremely popular because he's one of the judges on Planet of the Apps, a new program launched by Apple. Or agency workers in here, the Google Partners Academy podcast. It's a new podcast. The information there is amazing. They interview 
successful CEOs. See, if you want to know about the future, Singularity FM and good old Gerd Leonhardt will tell you all about that. And I'm just going to leave you with a final slide. It's a bit of a warning slide, is that technology starts off as magical. You have Steve Jobs stepping up on stage and telling you how magical it is. And we all want one. And then it becomes manic. It's pinging us from every which direction and driving us crazy. We can't put it away. We're staring at these screens all the time. And then it becomes toxic. It's when we're at the dinner table and we're all staring at our screens. It's when we lose our jobs because technology is more efficient at performing our tasks. So the future belongs to those who hear it coming, but it's owned briefly by those who build it. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? No? One? I haven't seen the app, but is there one question? Yeah, I had a quick question. I did in the app. A great presentation, by the way. You Thank mentioned you. it briefly how AI might play a role in this, but in your vision by 2021, 2025, what role does AI play in us having this digital relationship? Okay, very good. So AI is nothing more than a tool that helps us extract value from data. That's all AI is. It's able to recognize patterns, and through the data, through those patterns, it, it's able to predict things. So display advertising, it's all predictive. You're trying to, through the data that you have, you're trying to figure out, so what will someone care about in the future? And you show them a banner ad, and you hope that they care about it. So AI is all about extracting value from data, and you've all heard it, eh? It's going from the oil economy to the data economy. Data is the new oil. The oil economy is now seven billion and getting smaller. The data economy is eight billion, trillion, sorry, and getting bigger. So AI helps us extract value from data. By 2020, technology grows exponentially. Who knows how fast this is gonna grow? But one thing, you should, one thing that you shouldn't do is bet against it right now because it's just too obvious what's happening. And, and all you need to do is look at Uber, and look at Google, and look at what they're doing. You know, Google's already stated, already in 2013, that anything they built is AI first. Mobile's old now. One question from me for the prize. Um, okay, what am I going to ask? Let's see. Okay, who can remember what IA is? You have to yell it out. Intelligent assistance. Very good. What's your favorite color? Yellow, purple, red? Yellow. And a chubba chub. A spinner. Great, great present for kids. Okay, I'll get off stage now. <laughs>